Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. He is an author, and his name is Paul Angel, and he specializes in business plan, and he's an amazing business planner, and he's here today to, talk, to help, tell you and explain to you the different ways that you could actually grow and profit and excel your business through business planning. And I'm so excited to have you on today because it's 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 a pleasure to have someone here talk about business planning because a lot of companies, a lot of um, small businesses, entrepreneurs, they don't do business planning. They they go month by month, week by week, and, and they set goals, but they don't actually create a constructive business plan and it hurts them in the end because they're not where they want to be and they don't know why. So I want to give this stage to you. I want you to just tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. And I'd love to get dive into this topic because I think it's a topic that's well needed and, and should be talked about. All right. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I um, I love the what you just said. I love the fact that so many people don't have business plans because it. when I'm working with clients, it really helps me quickly uh, differentiate. And it's a really... If you don't have a business plan, having a business plan is the first step to holding yourself accountable and holding yourself accountable comes with some awareness of things like numbers and conversion percentages and things that we kind of sort of know, but it's more feelings than facts, maybe. And I like to make fact based decisions and, and knowing numbers is is huge. But yes, I've um, I started my own consulting business this year. In fact, I. Prior to that, I worked as a fractional CEO for law firms for a company that they provided C-suite services, and I loved it. But all I was doing was the coaching, but I was a <laughs> fractional CEO for like 30 law firms at once. Wow. I'm a little ADD, and one of my biggest fears in work that I do is that I'll get bored. Yeah. And being a C-suite executive for a law firm, even a big law firm, isn't a full-time job. I I got bored. I did that prior to working at the um at the, the coaching company. But I'm learning all of the things that I've been helping my clients with. You know, I'm not just coaching. I'm collecting money. I'm marketing. I'm selling. I'm I'm dealing with changes in technology. I'm dealing with uh problems with equipment and software, you know, all those things were just taken care of. We had an IT department or we had a sales team or we had a marketing division, you know, yeah. I'm all of those things. And I catch myself, gosh, on, on a weekly basis, at least once a week, reminding myself to practice what I preach and to have the same kind of self-accountability. And yeah. I, I, you know, I network and, and my network includes a lot of coaches, different kinds of coaches. And most of the best ones have coaches. <laughs> and, you know, it's something I had to remind myself. Um, right. But I, I, it's very exciting. It's very terrifying to be a business owner, just, you know, suddenly. And I'm having a lot of successes. I try to focus on the successes so they kind of drown out any missteps, I think. Yeah. But I, I know what to do. And I, I'm i really big on the whole accountability coaching, it's personal and professional. I mean, I'm doing business planning and I'm talking to business owners and we're growth focused. Yeah. But 80% of what I really do deals with mindset issues. Um, some people don't know their numbers. It's not because they're not available. It's not because they don't have solid bookkeeping and a good CRM with integrity-based data. And it's not yeah. that they don't have it. They like to continue to believe what they think is real because they have a mindset issue that says, oh, only selling 10% of prospects is bad. Yeah. You know, telling yourself you close 90% of your prospects when you really close 10 is bad because yeah. you're not giving, you're not investing enough in marketing. You, you think you need way less than you do. And yeah. it will explain why you don't hit your goals consistently. Um, and I pound on the numbers. What do you know? What do you don't know? 
What's, what do you think is important? What is really important? What's going on in your market? What are your competitors doing? Do you care? You know, those types of things are all accountability related and they're based on a business plan. But right. like I say, 80% of what I do is mindset. When I start, my process is I want to find out the owner or the partners or, or the group or sometimes it's spouses or whatever the ownership looks like. I want to know why, why do you get up and put a shirt on and work every day? What's your why or your purpose or your mission? You know, why do you do it? And I get a little pushback because 90% of people or more say the same exact thing. They'll say a family member, a kid, spouse, mom, dog, something like that. And yeah. I challenge them on that because that's, that's a responsibility maybe or an obligation or it, it your goals are attached to that, but yeah. you'd probably still, if you're, if your family left, you'd probably still work. <laughs> you know, there's something else that you need and it, you know, it's, yeah. and it's not just money all the time, but I want to find out what the purpose is, the thing behind the thing, and then get really, really specific with goals. I want to know personal, professional, financial goals. I want to know, they got to be smart, right? They got to be specific and, and um, measurable and attainable and relevant. And they got to have a time limit. And I, if it takes me 10 hours to make a business plan and I've seen it take way less and way more, it just depends on a, a lot of variables. But if it takes me 10 hours, I spent eight on the purpose, the mission and the goals. The rest is just math. It's it's it getting it once we get real specific with the goals, I've got a much stronger, more personal connection with the thing behind the thing that's running this business, why this business exists. Okay. And that gets me to proper motivation. Right. Because accountability coaching, you've got to be able to motivate people. We don't all wake up every morning ready to take on the day. Yeah. You know, in, in college, I can remember in one year, I had to buy three alarm clocks. I just kept breaking them. <laughs> I couldn't get them to go to snooze the right way. I ended up throwing it on the ground and stopped making noise. Um, that's That motivation is possible if you know the purpose and the why. And it's even more motivating when the goal and purpose and, and mission conversation they have with me is the yeah. first real one they've ever really had. Yeah. That's, that's when it's really powerful. And you, you, you know, it's almost like, I don't know, it, it gives them a, a, a productivity, effectiveness, efficiency high. Yeah. It, and you're chasing the dragon, right? It's like heroin addicts. It did the first goals that set, you know, all the next ones like, nah, this didn't really do it for me the way that first one did. Right. So much goes into the goals that when I get really specific on the goals, I want to find out, okay, you're working with me. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty obsessive about KPIs and tracking numbers myself, but I can tell you that, over 80% of the people I work with, their businesses grow by at least 60% year over year. And right. the people decide this is a business and, and it's consistent. I don't just do it one year and then that's the new plateau. We, we're going to grow again. And yeah. it's a cycle, but I tell them we're going to grow. You are going to have more business. And as a result, you're going to have more money. So let's right. look at 2025. If 2025, you have... 50% or 60% more money or whatever it is. I don't like to put too much time. What would you be? Who would you be? What would you do? What would you, where would you go? What do you want to have? Yeah. With, there was more money. What, what would you stop tolerating? In other words, are we going to finally redo the kitchen? Or are we, am I get a bigger house? Am I trade in the old Honda for a Mercedes? What, what would motivate you? What do you want? I want to go spend a month at, in Maldives with no cell phone. That to me sounds like the most amazing thing. That's yeah. not the most amazing thing to a lot of people. <laughs> not having their cell phone for 30 days seems like a purgatory. <laughs> they don't want to do that. <laughs> so, but I find out what it is and it doesn't even matter. Like I say, goals aren't dumb or stupid, but I might think they are just like 
Some people might think my goals are dumb or stupid. And I worked with, with owners all over the country. So if they were where I'm from, South Louisiana, oh, if I had more money, I'd get a nicer boat or a four-wheeler or a shotgun. Well, that is never the goal when I'm talking to owners in San Francisco. You know, every everywhere you go, there's just different, different goals. All I care yeah. about is that they're personal and they're motivating and they right. matter. Once they see that it's possible, it starts to it starts to motivate because I mean if you tell your spouse we're getting that kitchen you've wanted for so long and we're going to go to Greece for two weeks yeah villa on the Mediterranean or some uh, amazing vacation no yeah. one wants to go home and say hey uh, about Greece I had a bad quarter so we're going to just do a long weekend at the Jersey Shore instead mm -hmm. no. You get fired from your job as spouse. You, you're going to cause, no one wants to have that conversation. So guess what? They don't have a bad quarter. That's that proper motivation that I get by knowing what the goals are. So I make this goal-based business plan and it's it's really a, a spreadsheet. And yeah. full disclosure, I don't like to do math in front of people. I feel like I'm slow in figuring out math and I feel like people are judging me. And I, I'm, it may be all in my head, but I just don't, I'm not confident with math. But I'm super awesome with spreadsheets. I can make yeah. pivots, multi-page, and I can go back and forth. I, I know how to make the formulas and I can do really good spreadsheets. So right. what I do is I build spreadsheets with most of the common stuff in it. And I trust the numbers. Well, over time, my spreadsheets started getting really, really specific. And it basically produces a page, this is what we have to do each quarter. And this is what we have to do each month. This is what we have to do each week. And I can hold them accountability, but it's all based on the, the first conversation was, okay, you say you, you get a new kitchen. All right, how much will that cost? If they don't yeah. know, they got to call a contractor and get a quote. They right. say they want to buy a Corvette and I ask them how much does a Corvette cost? And they say, I don't know. That's not a goal. Right. Cool car. You need to go to the dealership, find out what it's going to cost. And with your credit, what kind of down payment will you need? And what's the monthly impact to your budget going to be? Is right. it going to be a driver or is it going to be just a weekend car? So can you get rid of a car note and pick that one up? What's what's the car insurance like? Um, you know, I want to figure out what it's going to cost every month for you to comfortably go and purchase that Corvette. And right. once they've done that work, you know, and I get that buy-in and they're all in and they're, they're doing yeah. it. It's exciting because you start thinking, you know, I talk oh, to yeah. people, they've got a business. It's profitable. Yeah. Their goal has been a million dollars every year for four straight years. And for the last four years, they made 850, 900, 875, 950. They just can't break a million dollars, but yeah. they're profitable. The owner's taken a couple hundred thousand dollars out of the business. It's, it's, it's a great business. It just won't grow because grow, growing takes some commitment. It takes some investment. It takes some expense. You yeah. know, like in a law firm, oh, I have to hire a lawyer. Yeah. Lawyers like money. They like to get paid no matter what, right? And the lawyer's going to need a paralegal. And the lawyer and the paralegal probably aren't going to want to work in my spare bedroom like I do. So I might have to get an office, you know, so all of those things you have to build into the business plan, but you have to yeah. think about it. If we're going to grow 50% in a year, probably means we're going to grow maybe 10% in the first quarter, maybe 15 in the second quarter, then maybe 25 and then maybe like 35, you know, we're yeah. going to go quarter by quarter. But once you get in that flow, the fifth quarter, which is the first quarter next year, is mm -hmm. going to be better than the fourth quarter this year. And right. we look at that. Well, what does that look like? Because 50% growth means if you were doing $50,000 a month in revenue, that means you're going to be doing $75,000 a month in revenue. If you're going to be doing $75,000 a month in revenue consistently, right? what's going to break? Who's going to die or jump out of the window or quit or, you know, something is going to break if you if you're not scaling to that number. So we have to believe that we're going to have the growth, but we can because we've got the motivation, we've got the goals and we've we've listed out. This is the first hire. This is the second hire. And this is the this is the financial control or the income trigger in Q2 that's going to make us start recruiting for that employee 
that we want to hire in Q3. And right. all that is in the plan. And then we're up on the balcony looking, you know, at the business. And then I got to meet with them every week because they get caught up in the weeds and the drama of the day-to-day running the business. And they can't see what's really happening. And assuming we were of sound mind <laughs> when we made the business plan, when they asked me questions like, I need help. I don't know who to hire. Like, wait a minute. What does the business plan say? And I feel, yeah. I've said that so many times that I feel, I don't know, my grandfather, when I was little, I, I spent a lot of time at my grandparents' house. They lived down the street. And I would ask him, what does this word mean? And he'd say, there is a dictionary on the table. <laughs> I would always think, asshole. <laughs> I know you know what that word means. Why didn't you just tell me? And I always go to the dictionary and look. And yeah. I feel like him when they say, I don't know who to hire next. It's like, what does your business plan say? Yeah. I feel like yeah. My grandfather telling me to go look in the dictionary, but it's there. We don't have to follow it. And the 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 big secret about business plans is they exist to change. It's okay if things change. Right. Long as we're 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 building policy systems and procedures to be predictive and to to be as efficient and effective as we can be with what's available, but I've I've had a few of clients come up to me, which to me sounded like maybe an alcohol infused manic episode idea to drastically pivot and change the business. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great, interesting idea. Let's compare it to the business plan and see if it still works. Yeah. Because if it still works and we can still make it happen, it's okay. Businesses yeah. pivot all the time. In fact, failing to pivot is a problem just like failing to plan. Right. Uh, I've, I've read Blockbuster had so many opportunities to pivot <laughs> and they just stayed the course and they couldn't they couldn't innovate well that whole when we change but if if the plan says no it's not going to work it stops there you know you've got to be obedient to the 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 process of the plan that's why the the purpose and the mission and the why and the goals are so important because those things don't really change right um you know it's it we had a uh i was talking yesterday to a guy in new york and he uh, I mean, he went to college in Israel and he was doing consulting for a company and they were expanding and they were buying, I guess, a golf course or something. And they were telling him that he was, he, they were interviewing him. Like he was doing the sales pitch that I should be your new consultant. And yeah. they said, well, this new property that we're acquiring is a restricted covenant golf course. Like we do not have minorities or Jewish members. Right. This guy's mother or grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. <laughs> He's like, there because I know my mission and I know my values and I know my goals and I know I know all this, I didn't have to consider whether or not I was going to take on this client. Yeah. You know, when you're aware of what you'll tolerate, and I I I've had this conversation, what we tolerate. Yeah. Is that our standard? I mean, we might have an idea that our standard is right here, but we're tolerating this sometimes. That means that's our standard. And that's a, that's a, a, I've had that, just that sentence be a breakthrough because we think our standards are something different than they actually are. But yeah, I'd rather know what it is and it'd be bad than believe it's something that it's not because then I can't use it for anything. I can increase a 10% sales closing ratio. I was in sales for 20 years. I've, I've done sales management, sales training. If I'm working with someone and they can't, they only sell one out of 10 yeah. of their leads, I can improve that number. But if they think it's nine out of 10, I'm not going to, if we think it's, if we really think it's nine out of 10, I'm going to be spending all our focus and energy and money on marketing. Right. But, um, in that case, marketing is different than sales. Marketing I don't, know, I don't know if you go bowling, but when you go bowling, there's the pin setter, right? That yeah. that thing is marketing to me. The bowling right. ball is sales. So mm -hmm. 
what kind of bowler are you? If you're throwing it in the gutter every single time, investing yeah. in more marketing is probably not a fiscally responsive solution to the problem. Right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. learning how to bowl down the middle because if you roll a strike every time yeah marketing can be minimal you know if you need 10 leads to get nine customers and you need 10 customers a month we don't need to pay the money to get 100 leads a month right conversely if you sell one out of 100 and you need 10 and you're getting a thousand buying another thousand might get you there but is that the smartest most effective way to get there Right, exactly. The numbers tell us what to do. And by looking at the numbers on a daily basis, because we have a plan and it, yes. it's, it's it's dragged out throughout the year, we know where to focus our attention. It's easy to prioritize, you know, yes. because sometimes I'll see people, you know, what they're focusing their attention on. It's like, I don't know, my kitchen and the rest of my house is on fire, but I'm making the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I make my bed every day. I get the importance of making your bed. Right. But it's never more important than putting out a fire inside the house, <laughs> you know, and you can't <laughs> see that sometimes if you, if you don't know your numbers, some people find out they weren't profitable in January <laughs> because they get their financial document. Right. If I'm working with you, we, we know, but we definitely know in that first February PM exactly yeah. how profitable or not we were and we can adjust accordingly because i've worked with people and i'm just like you're doing a lot of work to make no money yeah. if you worked at mcdonald's you would make exponentially more money than you're working 80 hours a week in this business and it's just you just don't have the funds or the or the market to grow it where you need it to be yeah I talk to a lot of people who are not really entrepreneurs and right. they left a job because they wanted to be their own boss or they wanted yeah. to go to the car line every day at three, or they wanted to uh, take off on Fridays to go have lunch with their friends in their yeah. douchey Lamborghini or something. That's, and they have a friend, they're, they're emulating a friend who's had a business for 20 years and that friend is able to do all these things. It's like, but there's chapter one and there's happily ever after it's, yeah. A lot of stuff happens in the middle. You didn't go ask them about their first year in business when their right. spouse left them and they had to sleep on the in the car and they ate ramen yeah. noodles, if anything at all, for weeks and they worked seven days a week and it was three years before they gave themselves a dime. Yeah. They earned that, you know, three o'clock douchey Friday. <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that's that's not a fair comparison. But the reality is when you go and start a business and I can attest to this because right. it happened to me. You're leaving a 40-ish hour a week existence for good, secure pay yeah. for an 80-ish hour a week existence with zero guarantees of anything. Yes. But one thing I will guarantee you is your first six months, you will make way less money than you made the last six months of the job that you left. Right. You don't want to do it. If they do, that means they've got that disorder. That means they're an entrepreneur. It's not always a good thing to have, but yeah. I can work with them because they're, they've are they got a realistic expectation. They understand that it's going to be more work, not less work. And yeah. that's, you know, you can, I know people that work really hard, but they're just busy. They're not, they're, there's no, there's no logical order to what they're doing. Their priorities aren't necessarily correct. And, yeah. you know, they're like, I mean, Fortune 500 companies, twenty percent of what they do makes eighty percent of their revenue. Right, usually the case. But when you're talking about new entrepreneurs, it's like twenty. You'd be happy with twenty. It's more like ten or less. And yeah. that, that ninety percent is not enough money. And right. you start maxing out credit cards, and you start getting loans, and you start you start doing what you have to do. And when it starts to happen. You don't get to enjoy it because you're so far behind the eight ball because you're 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 mortgaged out or you're you're paying thirty percent interest on yeah. fifty or more thousand dollars and it's 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 tough to bounce back from but you know snowballs go both ways you know when you when you start to get ahead you get ahead more and more and more when you get behind you get behind more and more and more and more um, yeah it's all about the direction and 
appreciating where you are versus where you were. Yes. Without knowing your numbers and having a plan and holding yourself accountable, your odds aren't very good. I mean, there's some businesses that in spite of the fact that they don't have a good plan, they don't know their numbers, they're making yeah. money. But I would, I would, I would die on the hill arguing <laughs> that they missed a lot of opportunities in right. how successful they could have been had they implemented those things. And that's, you know, but the the statistics, everybody knows 90% of new businesses fail. Yeah. And I wonder what would that statistic be if all of them would have had business plan. Right. That's, I mean, there's more to a business than a plan, but without a plan, the business is just winging it. Yeah. So what would you say like the first step is, for, like we talked about mindset. That's like one of the first, the, you stress that as a, a very important, you know, factor in the beginning that you should have a, a good mindset. Like if you have to break it down, if a person wants to say, okay, I need to start a business plan. I need to start a business plan. Step one, you would say change your mindset, correct? Well, not necessarily change your mindset, but be honest with what your mindset is. I mm -hmm. had to learn, and I learned this through experience of working with, you know, dozens and dozens of, you know, different personalities. Not everybody thinks the way I think, thank goodness, but, <laughs> but there's scarcity mindsets, there's abundance mindsets, and everybody, a, a lot of life coaches will preach, have an abundance mindset. Well, that's easy when you have an abundance, but- yes. I've seen people, you know, follow an abundance mindset coach off the cliff <laughs> by just, I'm going to, you know, oblivious to the realities that are, that are, you know, governing what I have. So if you, if you have a legitimate reason to have a scarcity mindset, get real honest with it and understand where it's coming from. I mean, I, I learned a lot. Like I, I grew up, I, I would, we didn't have any money. Like we weren't rich. We, we were probably poor, single mom, I had three siblings. And I was the oldest and my little sister and I, both of us were extremely athletic, but really into sports. I mean, yeah. And, and we were, we're to this day, I mean, I'm 53. And if she, we, her and I get together, we're, we're going shoot the basketball or we're going, and we're going to come in with a bloody nose. Like we, we just, <laughs> but we, we actually went to the, really fancy Catholic private school that had the good sports teams for free because the coaches wanted us to play on the teams. Yeah. Scholarships are illegal in high school. So they called it a work study, but basically meant we went Windex windows in the cafeteria yeah. one day in the summer and that paid all of our tuition and our lunch. And my mom thought that was a heck of a deal. Um, <laughs> And it helped because, you know, my whole network were these people who had abundance. But, yeah. you know, in the 80s in South Louisiana, we had an oil crash and everything's energy down here. So a lot of people were getting divorced. I knew a lot of people whose dad killed themselves. I knew everybody was moving, moving out of their big house into their apartment. You know, it was just it was yeah. a sad time. And while that's all going I was immune because I was broke as hell before the crash. So I knew how to act like they had to come to me for lessons, <laughs> but I went to the school and there's like sophomore uh, students, you know, driving Porsches and BMWs and these expensive exotic cars. And yeah. my mom couldn't add me to her car insurance. So I couldn't even get my driver's license because it was just too expensive. Well, uh, yeah. So, but, but that network was, I, and I kind of resented everybody for it, but growing yeah. up, when I got into business, my network is the people who had the luxury of having an abundance mindset. So I could ease into it. I could understand it. I had seen it, but I don't, under, I didn't understand. There are people that have some weird mindset issues with money, weird, that don't make sense to me. I, right. if my sister buys a nice car, I'm going to do everything I can to get a better one because it's a competition. Mm -hmm. I've had people, they're sabotaging their business because I can't be more successful than my brother because the way my parents feel about how successful my brother should be. And I'm just like, F him. Yeah. <laughs> I work yeah. at 
<laughs> Why? Who cares? Rub it in his face. Maybe it'll motivate him to get off his ass. What? what how is that a problem? Well, I had to learn to respect that because that's that's who they are and that's how they think. But that gives me a roadmap. These are the mindset issues. You know, you don't necessarily fix them. Right. You know, um, for example, I, I have two of my sons are gay. Mm -hmm. If two of my father's sons were gay, we would have probably been sent to some kind of uh, camp to make you straight. Right, right, <laughs> you know, right. Mindset issues can be that deep. You can't fix them. But yes. awareness of what they are and acceptance of what they are and having a strategy based on what, what it is, yeah, yeah, it's a mindset. If If you think you're broke and you have millions of dollars liquid in your checking account, yeah, there might be a prescription to fix that. That's something we got to fix. <laughs> but, yeah. but having an, an abundance mindset when you're broke and you, you're really not producing on a level that supports it could yes. be just a disaster. So when I say mindset, it's like exploring it, identifying it, coming to terms with it. You know, it's all, sometimes it's almost like I feel like uh, one of those um uh, divorce co-parenting coaches it's like okay i know how does that make you feel you know I, i'm not a mental health expert but I, I i feel that just like anything else that's the thing behind the thing that's causing you yeah. to miss out embrace it figure out what it is you know i'm i was always a salesman i was always an opportunist whenever something bad would happen my first instinct was always how is this an opportunity you know, when I lived in New Orleans for Katrina, um, everybody was out of power. And the, the the prognosis for getting power was at least a month. Yeah. And that's, what the hell, a month? We we don't, we die without electricity. We're pampered. We're humans. No, we got to have electricity. Well, you couldn't buy a generator. They were all sold right. out. I had a yeah. buddy that used to work uh, as a distributor for generators and uh, I asked him if how many generators he could get a hold of. He said, "I've got 400 reconditioned generators. I could put them all on a on a semi flatbed and bring them to your house." Wow! I was like, "If I don't sell them, can I give them back to you?" <laughs> so he yeah. said, "I need 200 dollars a piece." Generators cost 400 at that time, and but they could if a store had one, they'd sell it for a thousand. <laughs> because there was only one. Uh, right. I created all kinds of traffic. I had four of these generators going and I was selling. I sold them all. And I sold them all quick. In fact, I said, can you do that again? He goes, no, that's all the reconditioned generators we have. I, I, I'm not that high up in the company where I could just send you a bunch of generators. Yeah, but, I, uh... but I mean, I made tens of thousands of dollars while FEMA was paying me money. My company was paying me my salary. My mortgage company and my car uh, loan yeah. company suspended payments for four months. I'd never been richer. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a horrible storm. People lost their lives and, and houses were flooded and ruined. And I mean, I had $80,000 worth of damage to my little house and I was one of the lucky ones. Yeah. And, but it was an opportunity. And once you're in touch with your mindset and you understand your goals and you have a plan to see those goals, you start to realize it. You stop saying someday and you start saying, yes, I've already bought the plane tickets to Bora Bora and <laughs> I've scheduled it and it's paid for. I can't, I can't turn back yes. because I have a plan and the plan is I'm succeeding. And so I know I'll be able to do it. Right. That is, you work with, you know, you, you dance with who brought you, <laughs> whatever mindset or, or, or mental quirks you have with you, embrace them, get better, but they're not going to necessarily go away. And that's not necessarily a problem. It just means you got to figure out how is this impacting me at work? How is this impacting me with my employees or with my boss or with my coworkers? And that's, that's really the, to me, the mindset secret, but yeah. it, it's all related. The mindset is related to the purpose and, and it's usually the runs interference between your purpose or your why and your goals. And yeah. you don't hit your goals because mindset's trying to protect you or something. 
uh, you've got to, once you're aware of what it is, um, it, it's not guaranteed that you'll fix it, but you're, you've got, your, your odds are way better if you know yes. what's going on than if you don't. And exactly. that's how I deal with mindset. I'm sure for severe, you know, mental problems, there's, you know, there's things that can be done if it's that kind of mindset, but usually it's a, I don't think I deserve this. Or yeah. um, I don't, I, I don't, I'm afraid to, to, to take that leap of faith. Yeah. And I don't have any evidence to say that it won't work. Right. I've got this self doubt. Uh, I had a guest on a podcast recently and he said the most brilliant sentence I've ever heard. And he said it in passing and it wasn't like a profound statement, but I made him stop and say it again because I wanted to write it down. He's because he's talking about working and he was talking about algorithms. I, I was surprised that I wasn't all over my head because he was this math whiz. And he he says, Well, you know, it is everybody wants things to get better, but nobody wants things to change. And he was there was more to that sentence. I was just, wait a minute. That is so true. <laughs> that yeah. is, everybody wants things to get better. Everyone. Even, right. Even people who have it great, they still want it to get better. We, you know, we're yeah. always trying to improve. But you want to see resistance, especially in a business with employees. Change the software they have to work on every day. It yeah. doesn't matter if it's better, easier, faster, and cheaper to them. It means yeah. we got to change. So sometimes when you implement stuff like that, you got to give bonuses or raises or stuff because everybody is mad all of a sudden. An otherwise happy team is all, yeah. you know, you know, the, the negativity is just feeding on itself and it just, nobody likes things to change. Um, it's like in politics, we, we have this, you know, two party system and it seems like clockwork. Every time the parties change in the white house, two years later, they had this election for the Congress, the yeah. Congress flips to the other party every time. And every time. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we're scared that <laughs> People are going to change things. Can't change things because the president's got to get the Congress. The Congress got to get the president. But if they're on the same page, that's scary. <laughs> We're going to start mm -hmm. making changes and nobody likes changes. Yeah. But that was probably, of all the things I heard on a podcast, it was this math guy, this algorithm guy, telling me everybody wants to do better. Nobody wants things to change. That was like a magical sentence. That is a magical sentence. So when you when you look at when you have so basically you talked about mindset you talk about being a, with honesty looking at abundance looking at scarcity you know grabbing an opportunity purpose the why the making creating the goals is there anything else that you should we should emphasize to the listeners when when trying to create a really strong um, business plan that people should remember in their head that these are some aspects that they have to incorporate in the business plan if they want to be successful and if they want to go to Bora Bora or they want to get their dreams and become a reality. This is how, you know, don't forget these these few things or those the basic aspects that really draw a strong, solid um, business plan that will actually help you elevate to the levels in life that you want to uh, accomplish. Well, I... There's a book, if people haven't ever read it, I always recommend, and it's Colonel, I don't know the guy's name because I've, I've sold so many of his books, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, uh, The E-Myth Revisited, um, where it talks about, as an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter what the business is, you know, right. how many people are really, cook really, really good, and yeah. in a restaurant, it fails, because mm -hmm. they're just a replaceable employee. <laughs> right. You you have to be able, and there's a mindset here often, but you have to be able to delegate. Yes. And you have to be able to not to let go of a lot of control. And it's scary for some people, but um, like bookkeeping. Oh my yes. God. I know lawyers, lawyers who charge over $500 an hour <laughs> doing their own payroll and bookkeeping. <laughs> and, but they say they're good at it. They know how to do it. And it's not a problem. It's like, the problem is it's several hours of time, a week. And the best bookkeeper payroll company doesn't charge 500 a week. 
<laughs> right. They, they don't. <laughs> it, uh, it just, I, I guess you could try maybe get a CPA to do your bookkeeping by the hour, but still, you're yeah. and, and even better than what you charge per hour. That's working in the business. You could be working on the business. You could be networking. Yes. You could be marketing. You could be understanding the upcoming changes. You could be finding out about your team. You could be recruiting your next best hire. And that goes along the grain of who do you hire? Yeah. Goal should be, if you have an organization where you have employees, whoever you hire should absolutely be Richer, smarter, taller, um, better at volleyball, went to a better school, better connected, way more yeah. experienced than you. Yes. That's what you should be shooting for. Yes. But how many people do you know shoot for the opposite? Why? Because it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. I argue that it is not cheaper. Right. I had this right. fight with my kids because in a car, in most cars, if you get the regular unleaded gas or the super premium non-ethanol gas, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more expensive per gallon, but you get about 40% more miles per gallon. Right. I don't get the cheap gas because it's too expensive. <laughs> and in trying to get them to understand that, they're like, but if I put in $10, you know, I get the the gauge goes up higher. It's like, but it drops faster. You you look at understand the cost per mile instead of the cost per gallon because yeah. understood that you would understand that it's more expensive to buy the cheaper gas, and that's what I say about employees. And you can get a it varies state to state, but you can get a lawyer right out of law school for yeah. under. Problem is they don't know anything. Law school does mm -hmm. not give you any practical work experience and. Right. What you're doing, if you hire three hundred thousand dollar lawyers, you know when I say conversion percentages and numbers, part of my business plan is if you hire anyone, especially a timekeeper, someone that bills hourly, you need a three and a half to one ratio ROI. So if you yeah. pay someone one hundred thousand dollars, you want them to produce three hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue for the business. Right. Three hundred is acceptable. 400 is too much. If you have an employee that's giving you four to one, you need to give that employee a raise or someone else will. And then yeah. you're back to getting a hundred thousand dollar employee that might produce a hundred thousand dollars and take up all your time because you're having to train them. Unless your yeah. business is training new employees, hire that hot shot rock star $250,000 lawyer. When they say they can't afford it, well, the three and a half to one still applies to them. Yeah. Which means you're going to pay 250 and you're going to get over 800. Yes. What would you rather the difference between 250 and 800 or the difference between 100 and 100? Right. Which one is cheaper? So being able to let go, being able to get more big picture and strategic and and having all your tactics be based on strategy instead of necessity. It it's any business. I don't care if there's one employee. Any yes. business would benefit by hiring me to be their CEO. Right. They would grow, but they probably couldn't afford my annual salary. Yes. You know, but they would grow. Eventually it would make sense. But yeah, this it's not in the budget. When we're trying to keep the lights on and make payroll, <laughs> I can't bring in some, you know, fast talking CEO that's gonna need 200 grand a year. Well, yeah. that's where I really learned about, you know, fractional CEOs and fractional C-suite and, and coaching because it's not a full, you know, to help someone with their $200,000 a year Etsy business is not a 40 hour a week job for a strategic CEO. Right. But if a strategic CEO could become intimately familiar with the business and help with the planning and the accountability and understand the numbers and, and get the owner to understand why, Hey, this is a profitable business. This is how you max out your profits. And yeah. how we, one coach could be the CEO of 30 or more companies and they could all benefit probably the, not the same amount as they would, because I guess if it's a full-time employee, they're also implementing and executing and, and moving furniture and doing whatever needs to be done because they're getting paid and they're at the, at the office. But right. the business of coaching has 
you know, was really strengthening, COVID pushed it over the edge because a lot of people just left corporate jobs because they realized that, hey, I could make a New York City salary and live in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I got 20 acres and mountains all around me and I don't have to wear pants ever. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is amazing. I, you yeah. know, this is way better than my you know rat trap tiny apartment without a bathroom. That right. I was getting more, mm -hmm. you know, so people started getting more mobile and moving around. I think COVID really facilitated. There was a good thing that came from the pandemic. It was that. Yeah. Just like when Katrina happened, that's when it wasn't just kids texting because real time communication went out. So yeah. everybody that was down, you could send a text. And when you got up, the text went through. So while it was delayed and not a real time conversation, communication was still happening. And it taught everybody to text. Because before that, it, it was just the kids and they would, their thumbs were blurry because they had to hit the three, three times to get to C or so, you know, it was, they didn't have a keyboard like they do now. Yeah. What Katrina did for texting, COVID did for the remote working, but now things are available. I mean, I helped small law firms bag elephants as far as talent goes, because there's a hotshot lawyer at a big law firm and she's got a corner office. She's got a special needs kid that needs to be picked up by her at 3 p.m. And big law doesn't care. Yeah. You can say, I'll match your salary and let you leave every day at two or screw it. If you get all your work done, work from home. Right. Or I don't even have to match your salary because your priorities aren't. It's, it's money's the most important reason why people make a move, but it's not yeah. more than 50%. I right. Mean, I'd rather work for myself for 25% of the money I'd make working for someone else. Mm -hmm. Unless I was aligned and, you know, it was, it was a really, you know, healthy work environment. Yeah. It would take way more money to do that than to, to be in control and understand what I'm doing and having my own plan and implementing my own stuff. Right. But that flexibility that the smaller players had where, I mean, they were, they were, some coups were happening that, <laughs> you know, I was encouraging them to do. And they're like, she yeah. said yes. Look, all right. It's like, you know, the, the nerd asking the prettiest girl to prom. But yeah, yeah. So pretty, no one had asked her. So she said yes. You know, you 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 miss every shot you don't take. But right. that was that was a flexibility thing. So the a, ability to delegate to answer the question, <laughs> but the ability to delegate and to distance yourself from the day-to-day -day business and be more of a strategic person, you know, the true entrepreneurs, they get bored with their creation. Yeah. The non-entrepreneurs that start businesses and do have success, they treat their business like one of their children. It's actually creepy. Like they, they, they really, really are fond of this thing they created, you know, like we are with our kids, but it's just a business. An entrepreneur, it's just a business. Yeah. And an entrepreneur, Guess what? The business is for sale. Now the price is negotiable and you might not want to pay it, but everything's for sale if you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. If you're not and you're then you're that connected to the business, it's not for sale, not ever. In fact, you might put it in your trust that your kids are not allowed to sell it after you die. <laughs> People get attached to their business. And that's a, I don't say a red flag because it's not bad to not be an entrepreneur. A right. entrepreneur. It's just because it's bad to be an entrepreneur and you're stuck in a cubicle. That's yeah. like toxic hell for an entrepreneur. Right. You know, it's, but when you're a non-entrepreneur, you, you think emotionally about the elements of the business. And so you, you need to plan more because it forces you, I mean, as the owner, you're responsible for 10 things, but if you're a really good cook and every time things get hectic, you retreat to the kitchen because that's where you feel your best and your most productive. Yes. Things start slipping through the cracks and things right. start messing up because you're not paying attention to your marketing. You're not paying attention to your financial metrics. You're not paying attention to something because as an owner of a business, you got eight to 10 things that are equally as important as the job that yeah. an employee at that business does. 
my dad had a restaurant. I grew up in the restaurant business. I worked corporately in restaurants right after college. So I'm, I'm familiar with the service industry. And I met a lot of really successful restaurant operators. Yeah. The best of the best. Couldn't fry an egg. Could barely mm -hmm. book. They knew nothing about cooking. Right. And that it, they could run a restaurant, but they could also run a retail store. They could probably also run a, a insurance company. They they look at it this this business. I can make money with this business, and so this business will create revenue that'll create income for me, so that I can do the things I want to do. That's the whole purpose. That's why I start the business plan with the goals. I yes. need the money because we think we're motivated by money. We all think that, but if there was a stack of you know hundred dollar bills, you know millions of dollars on the floor right there. It's cool looking. And I'd probably take some Instagram videos in front of it, but it's not motivating. But if I don't need that money for my bills, I start thinking about all the ridiculously expensive, useless, moronic things I can buy with that money or the crazy, insane places I can go with that money. I can go to space, I bet. I think there's a price tag for that now. I mean, all of the stuff you can do with the money or- yeah or where you could go or who you can be. I mean, some people are motivated by donating money to their college or their church or what, it doesn't matter. It yeah. Doesn't you. That's something. Hoarding money is actually worse than a mindset problem. That's a, a right. uh, you know, a psychosis. <laughs> it doesn't, <Yeah>. it, it, <laughs> it paper, you know, it doesn't, it, yeah. but it doesn't really motivate like we think it does. Exactly. When I motivated sales reps, I, motivated them um with carrots and sticks i mean whenever someone would have a, a really good month like a really good month they got a big commission and yeah you know, cloud nine they're super confident i knew they're gonna have another good month right after because it, you know the confidence kind of stays with you i would i would and i'm maybe feel bad for this but it always worked i would say you know what i'm not surprised you put the work in you've now arrived yeah I got to tell you that being a hoopty piece of crap car that you go to your calls in, I think if you would get a car that better suits you, you would mm -hmm. walk into your sales appointments much more confident and you would make even more money. And you, you know, I, I think you're ready for BMW. <laughs> and you know why I'm telling them this? Because I want them to have a crippling car note so that they won't loaf on their on their sales calls they won't they won't half-ass their paperwork they will make sure they need to do everything they possibly need to do to make sure they max out their commission because if they don't they're going to lose that car right <laughs> that's that's one way to motivate but the car you know i and if it depends who it was i mean I, i'm their manager at that point so i know who they are some people were yeah. more, more motivated by, you know, a hundred thousand dollar pickup truck, or they're more right. motivated by a, an RV or, you know, something like that, or, you know, a house that has more than one bathroom because, you know, your wife's going to leave you eventually if you don't get a second bathroom, especially <laughs> when you have kids. That's right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that type of motivation, it's tied to the goals, which is yeah. tied to the purpose and the barrier between the, the goals and the purpose is the mindset stuff. Yeah. And mindsets, not everything can be cured. It's, you know, like when people talk about work culture, it, there's not a bad right or wrong culture. There's not good or bad culture. Your culture is what it is. Yes. But the real trick is being able to take off the rose colored glasses and accept what the culture really is. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, we love the, we love, AI headshots way better than our selfies, <laughs> but yeah. you want to get, you want to get to know the person in the, in the unfiltered picture, because um, that you have to, you have to make the improvements. If you're going to, if you want to get better, you have to, you have to be able to see what's wrong. Yeah. It, it all comes out because like people will say, I'm having these marketing issues. They say, they're, they're talking about these serious issues. I'm having issues getting this employee to do what he's supposed to do. Like whatever it is, I don't care. I don't jump right into whatever they say their biggest problem is. First thing we're yeah. going to do is we're going to figure out their purpose, their mission and, and their goals. And we're going right. to work those out. We're going to create a business plan. Now, if they're super, you know, anal retentive about it, they won't get off right. of it. We'll speed the process up. But I'm not skipping that step. Because I know once we get that in place and once we set up this and once we make the, the 
a strategy that that gives us action items one by one by one. I'm like, yeah. okay, now what is it you were bitching about on day one? And they're like, I don't know, that problem went away. Of course yeah. it did. Now we have a foundation that we can build on. The, the lack of the foundation was probably the root of that problem. And right. I don't know what it was. And it would take way too long to figure out what it was. Let's just create a foundation. And to me, it's like when the internet stops working and you go unplug it and you count to 10 and you plug it back in, nine times out of 10, that fixes it. Yes. I don't have to be an IT wizard to do that. I'm not yeah. a, but we worked at a place where nobody else knew that trick. So right. that was some job security, right? They were never going to get rid of the person that could magically make the internet work again. <laughs> yeah. I love but it. That's what it is. Once you create the foundation, your problems aren't as unsolvable or unfixable as you thought, or even yes. better, they're not really real. They're not there anymore. Yeah. But, but a lot of the tools that I give them and a lot of the stuff that I do with them, I'm teaching them also what to do. Right. Because when you, you know, you don't have a cohesive culture and you have, you know, conflict and problems with the with the workers or you're not you're not getting the buy-in that you want from people. Yeah. Find out their purpose. Challenge them on. Then find out their goals. What do they mm -hmm. want? And if right. they give you bullshit goals, challenge them. Push back. How much does that cost? Uh, you know, I want to go to Paris someday. Well, some days never. Yeah. Do you want to? How much does it cost to go to Paris? I don't know. I know. Let's get a price tag on this because if we want to go to Paris in 12 months and we find out that the trip to take the family to Paris would cost $12,000, what does that mean? You need an extra thousand dollars a month mm -hmm. now until then. Well, not everybody's salary has you know bonus potential to get an additional thousand dollars a month, but yeah. Depending on what you do, salespeople are kind of exempt because they go through goal training every six weeks. But this is going to be probably the first time that that employee has ever been asked by an employer what they're yeah. and then help them kind of strategically map out a way. Because what happens is this it's magical. What happens is they start to see the business the way you see your business. You yeah. see your business as the tool to make your dreams come true. You have right. ownership and, you know, people with ownership. I, I was, my dad had a restaurant and he would watch employees walk in the front door and step over trash to get in the front door before we open. And he's like, I know they saw the trash. Why they didn't pick up the, because the owner always picks up, you know, a speck of dirt in front of the business, right? Because they have ownership. And then you'll see that, you know, goofy half wit dishwasher show up and he picks up the trash. Yeah. ownership is not a title it's just you have it or you don't and you can develop it but how do you develop it one way is to see the business the same way the owner sees it because if i say well look in order for you to make an extra thousand dollars a month you would have to hit these metrics to trigger this bonus now yes. here's what here's a roadmap i can show you on how you can hit those triggers and yeah. you if you had an employee that is saying okay i want to make this bonus you're going to be more likely to say, I'll help you, you know, right. as you're doing it, give them a raise sooner. And as they're getting closer and closer, um, you know, if they're really, really knocking it out the park, give them a thousand dollar Delta airlines voucher or something really cool that shows that you you've accepted their goal as something you want to happen as well. Yeah. They have ownership and all of a sudden they're picking up trash in front of the building <laughs> because they saw it and they work there and they're proud of the business, just like the owner. That's yeah. when you take a C plus employee and they become a B plus or an A minus, just that, that ownership element. And yes. everything I do with them, I mean, I can make a business plan for an employee of a business. Right. You no, know, we got to find out what their goals are. We got to find out what their purpose is. We got to figure out what they have to do to increase their income. Right. Not everybody can, but showing that initiative and sh showing a plan like that. If you had an employee that said, Hey, I've got this goal. And the goal means I'm going to be getting a $6,000 raise at the end of this year. I want yeah. to tell you, I'm ready to earn that. So I want you to tell me exactly what I need to do in detail to hit that raise. Exactly. And that's going to motivate you to come up with some KPIs that are well worth more than 3.5 times 
six thousand dollars for the year because you can tell them exactly what they need to do to be worth six thousand dollars more because the math is in Paul's spreadsheet. <laughs> we can figure it out. I love it. I, I, I I'm passionate about what I do because I really like grow, growth. I'm, I've got an inappropriate relationship with growth. In fact, my podcast is called Inappropriate Growth. Um, I love it. But I have, I've literally made clients millions of dollars. Unfortunately, I've not made myself millions of dollars. <laughs> but there was never an instance when any of those clients who really, really blew up and made a lot of money, none of them were ever more excited about it than I was. Right. We share in those wins. And so when you impact something and you make it better. Yeah. You know, I my wife probably wouldn't appreciate me saying this, but I'd do it for free. Right. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I can't say that publicly because <laughs> people take advantage of it. But I mean, when I was first yeah. starting, I, I took on a client that needed me, but there was just no chance they could pay for it. No yeah. chance. But I was in South Louisiana. She was in Atlanta. She was uh, hanging a shingle, just starting at her law practice in her forties. She was very involved with nonprofits and um, uh, uh, discrimination stuff. I mean, we would have never met, right. you know, we would have never met. And what I decided was if I make her business successful, whether she's motivated by helping people or earning money or a combination of both, if I make her successful, she's now a commercial in a network of people in Atlanta, Georgia, that I would have never met. I drove yeah. in Atlanta once and I'm like, I never want to come back here. Traffic. <laughs> no, I, I hate it. I mean, I live in the country. I have, I have horses and goats and I, I bought my wife a, a miniature cow for Christmas. We got 60 chickens. I, I, I'm rural. It's 10 minutes for me to get to a gas station. That's the closest business to my house. Yeah. So a traffic jam for me means one of those extra wide tra tractors is going yeah. slow on the highway and I can't pass it. That's right. what I, that's a, a traffic jam I experience. I don't function well in, you know, gridlock where nobody's moving and I'm watching lights turn green and yellow and red and green and nobody's moving. I can't handle that. <laughs> that's, that's just not, that's not a skill set I have. So right. I would never, you know, build relationships with people in her network. Um, so I looked at that as kind of a marketing investment, but I can't make a whole bunch of marketing investments. You know, that that's, I'm, I'm too new of a company to, to do yeah. that, but I was just as prepared for every coaching call. I was, I put just as much effort into the, the business plan. And I, you know, I, I thought about specific, cause sometimes when I can't sleep at night, you know, you're thinking about, okay, this is something at work that I could, you know, I I spent some of my personal time thinking about her business, just like I do with the clients that were paying me. It doesn't matter. And so that's why I'm stuck doing this because I really, really enjoy it. And I, I, it. I mean, I hated basketball. I loved baseball. Probably had right. a lot. I played them both when I was really little. And it probably had a lot to do with the fact that I sucked at basketball, but I was fantastic at baseball. <laughs> So guess right. which one I liked better? The one I was good at. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't think I'd be good at brain surgery. Mm -hmm. I don't know I trust myself in somebody's brain. <laughs> it's scary. Although I recently went, it was a year ago, I went to a restaurant with my wife. It, we, we couldn't get a reservation for Valentine's Day. So we went the 15th. Mm -hmm. okay. My bad. I wasn't paying attention. But we go mm -hmm. to a really nice restaurant and it's one of those places where the sous chef comes out and asks you if, you know, the, how the food was. Well, the yeah. sous chef, I knew him. My goodness. I hadn't seen him in decades. I oh, mean, wow. Graduated from high school with my first wife mm -hmm. and he never knew I dated her. <laughs> like <laughs> so we talked before that. And our child from that marriage is 33 years old. <laughs> so it was a long time ago. That I yeah. since I've seen him, he hadn't changed, you know. But it was so neat. It was like Robert, Paul. I mean, it was it was one of those kind of exchanges. And I'm trying to get him up to speed. Well, my wife is actually my third wife, and I'm her third husband. Mm -hmm. And I, I threw that into the conversation and made a joke about it. Um, 
I said, well, um, I, I've had, yeah, I've been married three times. So I'm basically, basically a mental health expert. <laughs> wife who, you could probably pick up on this. She's the quiet one when we go places. She doesn't usually have the stories and the jokes and everything, but she can hang. I said that, and then I'm realizing, okay, that might be a little offensive. <laughs> didn't, yeah. didn't think that one through before I said it out loud. And then she said, well, based on how many times I've been married, yeah, I'm basically a proctologist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my wife said, oh my God, that's good. You know, when someone who's not funny says something really funny, it's like 10 times more funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything I say is a joke. It, it gets old. But with her, she doesn't. So when she when she tells a joke, it's like drop the mic. Like that was freaking gold. And she thought of it on the spot. I was like, wow, that's amazing. That's so funny. Oh my goodness. Now you wrote a book, right? So I did. tell me a little about the book. I want to hear more about the book. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it was it was born out of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. I had some free time. Um I started out everybody seemed to have a blog back then and I, I was a COO of a law firm and I was thinking about making a blog and then I was thinking about making a personal blog you know kind of starting to sort of create a brand maybe yeah. I was starting to be aware of that because I was so into the branding and marketing with the firm that we were growing right and so I wrote a blog and I said you know what a lot of people write one blog and then they're done and they never even write a second one I'm not going to yeah. publish I'm going to write I'm going to make it three blogs like in three parts so I wrote three, I don't know, thousand word blogs. And it was just about motivation, personal growth. And I'm I'm a whore for those books. Like I, I read self-help books and 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 say, in sales, you gotta because yeah. I mean you get rejected 90% of the time. And you gotta be able to dust yourself off and go get rejected again. And, and you, it, it's it's even the good ones are, you know, just need some help with motivation. So there's right. no shortage of motivational books targeting salespeople. And I've yeah. read hundreds of them. So I felt like I had one in my head. So I could write a three-part, you know, self-help blog and right. space it out. You know, it's like we would have our content creators for our, our website. Yeah. They wrote stuff and we just checked it right before in case something happened to change facts, you know you know if, if if it comes out after the election where this your blog is talking about some something related to Barack Obama well Donald Trump is the president it it doesn't even make sense anymore like we got to we got to modernize things but yeah. they're, they're basically written long in advance um, yeah i just watched a podcast that i recorded back in april <laughs> i was like wow my my hairstyles evolved that's a, that's a long time ago <laughs> but so I wrote these three and as I was writing them, they were, each one was getting to be well over a thousand words. And it was like, I was so much more I could write. And then I thought, I bet I could, I could write five chapters on each one of these parts. Right. So I did. And the chapters, it started writing itself. It's, uh, uh, I, I, I thought it was going to be fluffy and cheesy, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. I, you know, it's like, I don't know if you write, but sometimes it's like, Something else is writing it. You know, it's it's the, the words are coming to you. It's it, it's like a zone, like I guess a runner's high or something. It just starts yeah. happening. And writer's block is the problem because it's like, how do I get it like that? It's like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing. It's just not like it was. I, I'm something not there, which to me is the best use of AI. It can fix writer's block. But as it started writing more and more, I started involving people. It was mostly stories. It was, you know, self-help motivation. At the time, my youngest, Calvin, was learning to drive. And oh my God, he sucked. He was the worst driving person ever. I, I can't believe he ever got a license. I can't believe that I don't freak out every time he gets behind a wheel because he was so bad, like bad, bad. And mm. we're driving and we're driving in my new truck. <laughs> and he's driving and I'm, you know, nervous as hell because we're driving around my house and the ditches in or next to the roads by my house a big full-size truck would fit in like they're not like subdivision ditches they're ditches yeah. they're 12 feet deep some of them 
the culverts you can walk through to get to the other side. Um, mm -hmm. And he had this, he was overshoot curves. Like he would go too far into the other lane and we're driving and it's the curve to get to our house. And um, we're turning and he, he's going to go in the ditch. I said, stop. He goes, well, I can't stop. There's a car behind me. I was like, you got to stop. You you're not, we're not going in the ditch. I will kill you. Cannot go in the ditch. Stop. And you have to put it in reverse and back up. He goes, but there's a car right behind me. He's making me nervous. I'm like, if the car's been behind you for more than a minute, he knows you're the worst driver ever. And he's going to go around you. Don't worry about it. But this truck, it's brand new. The reverse lights work. I'm sure of it. When you put it in reverse, some lights are going to come on and they're going to realize you're backing up. But you have to stop and you have to back up. You, you've got to stop and you got to back up. And I thought to myself, I sounded like Howard. And Howard is this 75-year-old second cousin of my wife who trains horse trainers. Mm -hmm. And it was around that time that we got our first horse. Mm -hmm. And we took it to his his yard has, you know, arenas and all these things for horses, you know. So we were, went over there. He was going to teach us how to do groundwork and stuff with the horse. Well, we got the horse to him. And, well, she didn't want to back out of the trail. She wanted to turn around and come frontwards. And apparently that's a no-no. Got to mm -hmm. make him back up. And it's like, but she's not that big. She, she We can do it. It takes two seconds. Yeah. 45 minutes. Stop. Back her up. Do it again. Stop. This horse is going to give up eventually, but yeah. not to realize that you're not going to give up. So he's like, stop, back up, do it again. And when I'm telling him, stop, back up, I'm like, shit, I sound like Howard. <laughs> I, like after, by the time we got it to fall back out of the, the trailer, I didn't want to work with the horse anymore. I didn't want to go do, I wanted to go get something to eat. I was, I was bored with horses. I, I, I wanted to sell the horse. I didn't want to, you know, I was just too aggravated. He sucked all the fun out of it. Uh -huh. and I'm like, I sound like Howard and stop back up. And that was kind of a theme in that self-help. Sometimes you have to slow down and speed up or sometimes you have to. And it's my process. Like when yeah. someone tells me what their problem is, I want to It's like, OK, that's interesting. Now let's your business plan. Whatever right. they say their problem is. OK. First thing we're going to do is a business plan. I don't care what your problem is. <laughs> it, the first step is going to be business plan and, and we're like horse training. Whenever right. someone, whenever you hire someone to train a horse, I don't know if you've ever done that, but when you when a horse trainer sees a horse for the first time, they don't care that you said, "Oh, this is a good horse. It's calm." It, they don't care. They're not going to take your word for anything. Every mm -hmm. horse they get the first time they get the horse, they're going to take it in what's called a round pen, mm -hmm. and do just some basic side to side movements and see how responsive the horse is and and they're looking for you know behavior issues that they may have to correct but the horse can kill you oh yeah to respect this 1200 pound beast and so it doesn't matter if you're bringing them because they have a specific problem they're not as worried about the problem as they are but their first step is always so you're always gonna have to stop and back up and go to step one and that that's how i run everything that's how i do my coaching. That's how I, you know, how I taught my terrible son to drive. You got to stop and you got to right. back up and you got to do it the right way. And when you do it consistently that way, it minimizes problems if it doesn't just eliminate. Right. Because now, once we okay. established how to communicate with the horse in the round pin. Yeah. They're, they accept that you're in charge and they listen to your commands and whatever problem you had before went away. They didn't go fix the problem. They fixed, it's, it's like causes versus symptoms. So the book is called Stop, Back Up, and Grow. I love it. I love and it. Now, where can people find this book? It's on Amazon. Uh, I actually, I had a bunch of my friends say, oh, I only listen to audiobooks. Is it on audiobook? And... To appease them, I went to a studio and actually re read my book at the studio with the team where they said, stop, you you said the wrong words, Do back up, you know, we're doing the whole thing. So I went to a studio, so it's on Audible. It's on Audible, it's an ebook, it's a hardcover, it's a soft cover, uh, published with Mindstar Media, um, but it's it's a drop ship kind of thing, hybrid publishing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, It got me that 
crazy cool job I had for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could have got me a lot more than that. If I would have been positioned like I am now and had a coaching business and had a, had a, um, you know, fractional COO service, if I had some of those things available when the book launched, that yeah. would have been boom. Unfortunately, books don't have that same impact anymore. Because right. You can get a ghostwriter. You can get AI to write a book. Uh, and there's a price tag for being a bestseller. Mm -hmm. Like you pay this amount of money, you're automatically an international bestseller. So every business owner that wrote a book for marketing purposes is an international bestseller. <laughs> Touting a book that no one's ever read. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it wrong. And I'm, I'm, maybe I'm bitter, but because I did all my book signings at restaurants, Mm -hmm. I went to the printer to save a dollar a book and bought a thousand copies of my book. And I mm -hmm. sold them all in a week. Right. Motivational self-help business books. If you sell 40 books in one day, you will finish the day in the top 100. Mm -hmm. 100%. I sold a thousand books in a week, mm -hmm. but they were all straight from the printer to the people. Right. I covered the expenses of publishing and, and the, the the publicist, but I can't say I'm a bestseller because <laughs> mm -hmm. you have to be in the top 100 for at least a day. Right. Sold probably over 10 times more than I would have needed to sell <laughs> and be a, a, a bestseller. But so, but now everybody knows that. I mean, the old trick was you um, mark your, ebook down to 99 cents and you buy 2000 copies of it <laughs> or then put list your book in the underwater basket weaving category there's not a lot of books there you know you can be the best seller if you sell just a few um but it's not working like it was it's not that marketing magic like it yeah. like it was but podcasting is and podcasting is now but i'm a perfect example everybody's got a podcast now so as pretty soon everybody will have a podcast, which means it won't impact the marketing. But right now it's hot. It's the best thing, especially if you're in a business where you're where you're teaching or coaching or advising because more than a book, if they're watching your podcast, they're watching how it is to work with you. Also, where what kind of services do you provide? Well, I'm a, a business planning accountability coaching, but I, I don't separate those. Like if, if you wanted business planning, but not the accountability coaching, I would do it, but it wouldn't be cheaper. Because right. I, it's, it's, yeah. The accountability coaching is more important than the business plan, but mm -hmm. it's impossible to do without the business plan. So the right. business plan is like the prerequisite for the coaching. So I, I take on coaching clients and I I'm create a business plan. I create a matching budget and I do weekly calls with them. Um, I also will do fractional COO jobs where someone needs a little bit more than strategic. They need an integrator, an implementer. They need yes. someone to come in and execute whatever the plan was. And, yeah. and a lot of times I would come in like as a fractional COO, but they have mm -hmm. an office manager and he's good, but he's not a COO. Right. My job is I got six months to turn this person into a COO. And right. so I'm basically coaching that person up and leading by example and show you know by the time i leave now because for a, a an executive management position when you're trying to grow the biggest mistake a lot of small businesses make is hiring from within because right. you got this office manager who's loyal and they're great and 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 you trust them yes but they know less about running a 10 million dollar business than you do you need right. to find someone who's actually done it and the problem is when you find someone that's actually done it, you piss off the office manager who thought they could have done it. And the new incoming COO just lost the most valuable employee. <laughs> and right. so it's a delicate process to do. But if you do it on a temporary basis, you can sell it to that person as, look, this is your glide path to that promotion. Um, so I do fractional COO work where they'll hire me for maybe 10 hours a week. And in I those cases, Usually in the first month, I'll fly or drive, depending where they are. I'll go to their office 
because I want to interview their entire team. I want to meet them. I want to see what's done. I want to, I want to take notes in private of operational flaws. I want, I just want to, I want to be able to get a feel for everything in person, but then right. most of the work is remote. So I do fractional COO work. Um, and I am a big believer in referral marketing. I mean, I, I'm an affiliate for a bunch of different people. And it's not because they pay me to be an affiliate. It's because yeah. they're good. And right. they, I, I'd rather recommend someone that's going to do what I said they were going to do yeah. than someone who might not, but I get some money like that. Yeah. But there are people who do great work who are affiliates and right. that, that, and that's reciprocal because there are people that, that I pay to bring me nice clients. You know, there's, I, on my website, it says I do legal recruiting. Mm -hmm. I don't know the first thing about legal recruiting, mm -hmm. but Molly McGrath is brilliant at it. She is the, she is a beast. She's a magician. She can make stuff happen. Yeah. And she's not cheap, but she's worth it. But right. whenever I give her a lead, I don't even think about it. Just down the road, I'm checking the mail. There's a check from her for a thousand dollars. And I don't care what you got going on in your life. It's never a bad time to get a surprise thousand dollar check in the mail. You know, I call it, I call it mailbox money, but every nickel matters, you know, as a new business. And so I put, and I also know enough about SEO to be dangerous. So I put all my affiliates as services I provide, but the services I actually provide are the accountability coaching with the business planning and the fractional COO stuff. But if you go to my website, I do bookkeeping, I have CFO services, I do marketing, I do <laughs> recruiting, I do remote HR, I, but it's all of those are affiliates and those are people I've over the year have worked with and they're all vetted. You know, they, I, I'm, I'm making a recommendation for either a vendor or a service provider or a product. Now, where can people find you? Well, my business is called Law Familia. It's um, lawfamilia.net. And there's one L in familia. Because I think familia, it's the same word in Spanish and Italian, but one of them has two L's. Mm -hmm. And I'm such a gringo, I don't know which one. <laughs> but So it's the one L, it's not two L's. And it's very important with the website. <laughs> but uh, lawfamilia.net, I couldn't get .com because there's some a family law firm in Bolivia that has, has lawfamilia.com. Um, and I also, I'm also active, very active on LinkedIn. That's probably my, my organic social network of choice. Mm -hmm. That's the one I, I, I get the most traction. I pay the most attention to. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn every day, all the time. In fact, if you, if you send me a message on LinkedIn, it's almost as good as sending me a text message. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn. And I I actually write a blog every single day and post it on my La Familia page. I also share it on my Paul Langell page, but uh, I write a blog every day and I make little 30 second video shorts. Mm -hmm. Usually when I'm on a podcast and the uh, host is gracious enough to share the video, I'll chop that up into little 30 second spots and um I'll kind of rotate those, but every day I post one of those little short videos and it's might be the most profound thing I said in 30 seconds in that whole podcast. But, uh, and it's also a short blog about something useful that would be helpful to business on. So I'm, I love I'm a contact, I'm a content machine because I do it all myself on Mondays. I don't do any, I don't schedule any appointments on Mondays. Monday is my day to my creative day. So I can get a lot more, creative work done if I stay in that framework when I'm trying to do a different one every day because like the first one might take an hour well the right. second one might take 30 minutes the third one takes 10 minutes and so if you do all five of them back to back to back you don't spend nearly as much time as if you spend an hour to do one a day I love it this has been amazing Paul I got to thank you so much for coming on the show this has been a, a, a wonderful wonderful podcast and you've You've given us an amazing amount of information and and tools and strategies to help grow 
And I, I got to tell you, this has been just a hell of a podcast. And I really thank you for coming. I hope you'll be on the show again. And I, I really enjoyed this. I, I don't have, I'm, you know, I don't have a problem coming up with things to say. I never, <laughs> in fact, I recently found an old kindergarten uh, report card. <laughs> Every little <laughs> six weeks, it said, um, Paul needs to learn to not talk to people that are not wanting to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I enjoyed it. My whole process with my business is I I'll give an hour free to anyone business coaching and I'll I'll show them my whole business planning process in that hour. If they're really smart and they're paying attention in that hour, I don't hold anything back. They have everything they need to make their own business plan and hold themselves accountable. But I'm banking on the fact that a percentage of the people that I show that to will realize this is something that they need mm -hmm. and a percentage of them will admit that they're not going to follow through and right. they need to help. So my goal is if I've got an open spot on my calendar, I want to fill it with a free business coaching, business planning session. That's the, to me, the best thing that I can do. And I enjoy doing them. And it, just like this podcast, you can tell when I enjoy something because it, I, I'm, I don't have a good poker face. If I don't like something, it's also <laughs> obvious that I don't like it, which is mm -hmm. kind of tough for me in some situations. <laughs> I can't. I can't. It's tough, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been amazing. I really enjoyed having you on the show and I hope you'll be back. I'd love to continue the conversation to get dive deeper into some of these topics that you hit. You hit really some great topics today that I think we could really work on. And, and I think our, our listeners will really enjoy learning more about from your perspective. So thank you so much for coming on the show. This Thanks is for having me. This was great. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day. You too. Thank you.